All right. As you guys I was totally not ready to give this talk today. You saw me running make to actually prepare my slides out here on the podium. I miscounted. I am going to talk about the current state of SC Linux as released in Edge. I'm going to talk about the different SC Linux policies that there are. And uh, well, I was going to stop there, but we released Edge in better shape than I had hoped for when I first gave this uh, abstract for the talk. And there's very little for me to say here. So I'm going to change the scope of the talk and talk about what we ought to be doing for Lenny and beyond. Okay, let's see if I've got this thing compiled right, in which case. Okay, so. We shipped Edge with SE Linux installed by default in the base, but not enabled. So if somebody wanted to take a base Edge machine and convert it into a enforcing mode SE Linux box, it is very easy to do so. In fact, Russell Coker gave a talk about uh, SE Linux on Edge in five minutes or less. And he demonstrated on the podium how easy it was to do so. I am not daring enough to try that. There is a wiki page. And somewhere in the next few slides, I think, I've got uh, the URL. It's wiki.debian.org slash se Linux setup, which uh, leads you through the steps required to uh, turn on SE Linux in the edge install. OK, before I go on, I don't think this is the way it is supposed to work. OK, so the first thing that I'm going to talk about is what are the types of SE Linux policies? In the beginning, there was just the example policy. This is what the NSA supplied us. And it was supposed to be just an example that the rest of us were supposed to modify and enhance and bring to the distributions. But as is usual in the ca case of free software uh, projects, everybody just kind of fed back patches and nobody took up the task of, you know, forking the Linux policy and taking it away from the NSA. The policy, however, was strict in the sense that NSA shipped us stuff that said everything is denied by default. You don't provide a policy, the machine doesn't even boot up because in it is not authorized to do the kinds of things that in it tries to do when you invoke it. Red Hat, when they tried to ship SE Linux, found that their customers, the, the most frequently asked question to date for Fedora is, how does one turn off SE Linux? So they started off and said that, OK, we are going to have uh, a policy that doesn't try to control everything, but only controls targeted servers. And what are the most vulnerable points on any machine? It's the software that faces the internet. Any software that faces the internet or has to get input from untrusted users in order to operate. So they said that, OK, we will constrain those targeted servers and let everything else go free. So we got targeted policy. The NSA was not very happy with this because everything was still based on the example policy. And they have better things to do than to par participate in the flame wars that are part and parcel of any you know, free software project. 
hey, just look at us. Or look at policy or private in the last few months, and you'll know what I mean. So the next thing that came up was, and what we are working on now, is reference policy. Uh, this again comes in the strict and targeted flavors, but it is totally different from the uh, uh, um, NSA policy, and it was designed to be the testing grounds of uh, innovation and changes in way which security policy is implemented. The first thing that we, uh, people did for reference policy was make it modular. Think of it like of uh, SE Linux policy as somewhat like the Linux kernel. There is a core set of operations that you need to control. And then there are optional modules that you may or may not want to plug in depending on what your uh, machine does. The reason you don't want to have one giant policy that you load all the time is, well, first of all, it's not that flexible. You, it's not easy to replace parts of policy with something you have written locally. And secondly, it takes up a lot of kernel memory. I mean, the SE Linux policy essentially creates a bunch of two-dimensional tables. And the more instructions that, the more rules you have in the policy, the larger the size of in-memory kernel tables. And uh, well, now that we've got modular policy more or less where we want it to be, as far as feature set is concerned, it's not complete in coverage. They basically, I think we only cover well the packages that you get with Red Hat Enterprise Linux, uh, which is a far cry short of the 10,000 or so source packages that we ship now. I haven't been keeping up. It was 9,000 or so about a year ago. Anyone know what it is now? The source packages that we have in lending? In lending? Hey, come on, guys. This should just be a one quick Google or app cache search. Well, while we are waiting for people to uh, come up with the answer, um, if you have two different policies and only one of which is being used, inevitably there's going to be drift. So the policy that is used less, the strict policy, is liable to fall into disrepair. And actually, that is the policy that we want to push in the long term. Uh, I'm not going to go into this talk why we should be running strict policy. I talked about it last year, and I'll be happy to convince anybody who dares come up with me at offline about why this shouldn't be running a wide open machine. Uh, why is there so little audience participation right now? Oh. I forgot. Uh, lunch. Ah, yes. We don't want the policies to diverge. So what the current move is to create one policy, which will effectively be the strict policy, and create one loadable module called unconstrained, which goes back and changes the strict policy into targeted policy. So anybody who feels like running just the targeted policy just has to load one extra module. And conversely, just unload that module to go back to running strict. Um, given that, I would like to move us in Lenny closer to being able to go to SE Linux by default. So what is it that constrains users who want to run a Linux? There are a few prerequisites. Uh, RazorFS, for example, 
doesn't fully support atomic rights of attributes, which means we cannot run SE Linux on a machine that's using ResRFS because we can't label the objects on the file system. Um, nobody that runs SE Linux that I know about runs XM as well. Me, I still run SendMail. I learned SendMail.cf back in the 80s. I spent a lot of blood, sweat, and tears learning SendMail.cf. I'm not going to give it up anytime soon. <laughs> hey, I still know a 80, 85, 80, 86 assembly. None of the newfangled ones yet, but. So X, if you want to use XM, you would either have to find somebody who, who knows uh, SE Linux policies and writes one for you, or you need to figure it out yourself, or go postfix. Lemont is out here in the audience. He'll, I'm sure he'll be happy to help any site transition to postfix. Um, so I mentioned that there are some tweaks that are required to enable SC Linux. And uh, those fall into three major segments. One is authentication. Sure, it's in it, Linux is available and installed and ready to go, but we still got to tell things like uh, login and SSH and XDM and WDM and so on, that when a, somebody logs in, a new session is started, that that session gets the proper security ID that will be used by AC Linux from that point on. The way AC Linux policies are constructed is like there is a subject, which is usually a process, and gets a security domain based on their, who the person is who is logged in, or in special targeted cases like Apache. Apache always starts running in the Apache security domain. And um, then there is an object, which is usually, usually some kernel structure, like a file directory socket. And then there are actions that you can do. Subject can do stuff to object. In order for the subject to be properly classified, you need to tell you it who you are when you logged in. There are a bunch of cron jobs that uh, do things which are not exactly security conscious. For example, we back up shadow and G shadow, which means cron needs to be able to read and write shadow files, which is not really what I want to do. So we can handle this by putting the backup job in its own security domain and giving the read security files, I mean, shadow files capability only to that one executable. Nobody has done that yet, so the advice is to just not back it up or back it up manually or, you know, live dangerously and not worry about shadow files. Uh, there is also locate, which runs find all over the file system, which means the locate binary needs to be able to read every single file on your system, which gives security people the nightmares. Again, that uh, is a suggestion to disable that. Uh, there are other miscellaneous things like uh, slash etc motd is regenerated at boot up. I guess we could write a special binary and security policy to allow you to do that. Frankly, I don't really have that much new going on every time I boot up, so I just replace it with a static file, which can be labeled. Uh, dev.static is a nightmare again, because nobody has written policy for it, and you need to recreate everything for slash dev in there. Uh, th then there are also, I'm sorry, I'm getting lots of mail while Static PTYs. If your PTY remains persistently at, 
It changes the ownership, so it has to be labeled every time it does so, which is a pain. And Debian has supported dynamic PTY since oh, Lord knows when. So you are advised to remove all the static PTY so the system doesn't use it by mistake. Um, the URL at the bottom is a pointer to a shell script that uses a dev bootstrap to create a local file system for you and makes all the changes that are mentioned on the wiki page. So if you just wanted to create a new file system for a new Zen or UML virtual machine or for a Chiru jail running a C Linux, you can just use that script and all the five minutes of tedium hacking around configuration files using VI. Okay, this is, once you've made those changes, I'm not going to read through all of this. This is on the wiki. This is the sequence of steps you need to do to get a Linux running. After installing the packages, you relabel your file system so it has the proper security labels. You edit grub.conf. I just added an, or an other option, so I have, for every kernel I install, I have three lines in grub. One is the normal, one is recovery, and the third is the SE Linux option that allows me to boot in SE Linux mode. Relabeling is one of the most expensive parts, and this is what takes up most of your five minutes trying to get SE Linux running. Are there any questions? Or should I just gallop through this so that we can get out to lunch as fast as we can? Okay. All this that we have been doing has been targeted policy because it was too difficult, still is too difficult to get things running in strict policy. Um, because really, apart from a few AC Linux developers, I don't think anybody anywhere ever runs strict policy so far. Even the Red Hat stuff is uh, just targeted. The good news is, after you make the few mods about uh, cron trying to back up shadow and stuff, which will be disallowed even by targeted policy, targeted policy essentially runs out of the box with that. There have been lots of reports about people running servers on edge with targeted po policy in enforcing mode. And I really see no reason why we, anybody should be running any server and not run at least the targeted policy. It doesn't cost you, it might cost you two to 3% slowdown as compared to something which is not running SE Linux. But uh, the kind of security, the kind of, uh, you know, the ability to sleep at night is probably worth the 3% uh, hit. And if you are really that close to your performance requirements, I strongly suggest you update the hardware because by now, every six months you get more than what is SE Linux it is gonna be. Okay, so. If you want to run strict policy, you should run with auditing turn on. Recently, some kind soul packaged and uploaded the audit uh, package into SID which saved me the trouble of having to go out and package it. And I've been meaning to do so for a couple of years now. And then, the minute we start running strict policy, you boot up, you'll get a gazillion error messages. And essentially, you just um, run something called audit to allow, which grabs all the error messages that you have been getting, 
and spits out a local module, a policy module, that you can load into your running policy. It's usually a good idea to take a look at what it has spit out, because some of those things that it's telling you to allow you really don't want to allow. You pro so in that case, you just tell it that don't allow it, but stop yelling at me about why you are not allowing it. So just silently drop this request. And this is all it takes. There are essentially four command line commands that you have to run to take any SE Linux system, run it on strict policy, grab all the error messages that has generated, and make them go away one way or the other. So at this point, I think I'm done with the original premise for the talk. So how much time do I have left? I'm sorry, I, my eyes aren't what they used to be. Oh my, I've got lots of time. Okay, so future plans. What do we need to do to support stable? I have acquired a login on the backport uh, service machine, and I intend to backport the current tool chain for AC Linux and the reference policies back to Edge. And I also am committing to do all the security updates as required for the SC Linux packages. Um, I'm hoping that I will inspire loads and loads of you to immediately jump out and go and grab SC Linux and start running it. But I can see about five people in the audience who are fast <coughs> asleep, so maybe I'm not getting the message across as well as I thought I would. Um, we do need help with people running the strict policy, even if they don't run it in enforcing mode. If you send me back the errors of, for your configuration, I'll be able to create uh, policy patches that will make SE Linux strict work on your machines. So as long as people tell me, send me all the AVC denied messages out of war log messages or wherever. I promise to put in the work to make AC Linux work on your box. I mean, is that an incentive or what? Now this is where I am going to run into a bit of pushback probably from the installer and the release teams. Uh, I'm trying to make it a personal go a release goal, a personal release goal, to have SE Linux better integrated into Lenny, to make it possible for somebody to go from the, start from the get-go, tell the installer that I want a SE Linux box, and have it happen. As I said, the most expensive part of getting a C Linux to run on your box is relabeling the entire file system so that every single file has the proper security labels. The reason is that right now the installer does not label your file system as it is being installed. So you have got to go through that expensive step. If, however, we can make minute changes to the installer, without compromising this ability to install Debian on any machine, then it would be far easier to just have people optionally start off the a SC Linux machine in either targeted or sick policy in enforcing mode. So what do we need to do for that? First of all, from the SE Linux side, we need to be able to update a machine's security policy 
somewhat similar to how we already update the software packages. Something which is uh, aware of the mapping between Debian package names and uh, SE Linux policy module name. Uh, something which is aware of not only the software package dependencies, but also about policy dependencies. For the most part, you don't have to worry about it because the policy dependencies more or less follow the uh, package dependencies. But there are a couple of exceptions, and we need to make sure that when you say update my SE Linux policy, it should be able to look at the packages you've installed, figure out what policy modules you need in order to have those packages actually work, figure out what the dependent policy modules are, and then go out and load those uh, policy modules into your running policy. We currently do this only during the post inst of the SE Linux policies. Next, we need to have the policy for a particular package, say Apache. You want to have the policy for Apache loaded before you tell the package to install the package. Because when the package is being unpacked, the system needs to know what the security label, the initial security label of that file has to be. Ian Jackson has created a whole bunch of triggers for the package. He specifically left out the pre inst trigger, which is exactly what we would need for this to happen. So I guess one of the things that has to be done is after Ian's trigger code gets into the package, somebody has to go in and hack the package to add the pre inst trigger, if for nothing else, for the security policy too. Yes? Yes, a, a pre inst trigger in, in the way that Manoj is, is suggesting is fundamentally um, incompatible with the point of triggers, which is to delay processing. Um, so I think maybe Manoj and I should talk about this outside the session. Right. I don't, technically and conceptually, there's no reason why we can't have pre inst triggers. Yes, All there the is. Um, all right, maybe we should take this off, but <laughs> it might be incompatible with the way that the triggers have currently been coded. So maybe I should call it something else. All I need is the D package consult a list of something or the other that says that before this package is loaded, you've got to run that one particular load policy for the package command. And uh, the reason I say that this is not impossible is because I do have a hack D package that does that for me. So uh, faced with a running example of a D package, it's kind of hard for me to stomach the claim that it, what I'm doing is not possible to do. My way is hackish. I would like to m improve the way it is done. But there shouldn't be any technical obstacles to this. Um, one of the reasons to do this is, right now, all SLinux policy is one package. Even though we don't install all the policy modules into the running kernel, we don't, have, we don't load all the modules, we do ship them along with the reference policy package. And I think this is the way it should be at this point because both SE Linux and the reference policy are rapidly moving. For example, we have just included the ability to label network nodes and to have end-to-end -end security. So not only can you say that I want my application to only talk to clients coming from such and such a security domain, so I can say that um, 
my client, my server on this machine should only talk to clients coming from nodes that have been labeled a company confidential high nodes. That means they are not, you know, I'm not talking to the internet. And on those nodes, I should only be talking to a process that is in the accounting domain. So you then set up your company so that your uh, finance service-oriented architecture is only accessible for people in the accounting department running on their official machines and from nowhere else. Um, with these kinds of changes coming so fast and furious, it is not reasonable to expect every maintainer out there to keep track of what the policy um, syntax du jour is. So it still makes sense to have one common pack, uh, uh, policy package. But post Lenny, I'm hoping that SE Linux would stabilize to the point where all these, well, everybody would be running SE Linux by then, of course. We would be ship, shipping SE Linux by default, post Lenny. And therefore, it would be reasonable. I see France giving me the dirty look. And it would be reasonable to ship policy off to the maintainers themselves. To, so you have a new, uh, you change the behavior of your package, you modify the C Linux policy that ships with it, and somehow we manage to get the package to install the policy before the package is installed. Hey, I've got three years to think about that. I'm sure I'll come up with something. Um, Next, uh, I would like to have the Debian installer label the base file system. So this isn't really very expensive. Uh, it, you should be able to do this without compromising the rest of the Debian installer. And uh, it would save a lot of effort on the part of people trying to run a Linux uh, system. Along with that, if you can add a optional question early in the install process asking, I'm hoping before task cell, asking whether you want a, a Linux machine or not. And based on that, you load the uh, policy before you load any other packages. We ship the policy anyway. If the file system is labeled loading the SC Linux, reference policy will be fast. And finally, we modified the grub configuration file to add a SC Linux option, like I showed in the slides a few slides back. And I think I'm ready and waiting for the audience participation now. Nobody? Nobody wants to talk about? Uh, could you grab the mic, please? Hi. You said yourself that uh, in Fedora, You said yourself that in Fedora, most of the desktop users switch uh, SE Linux off because they have all sorts of uh, problems. Do you think it makes sense for Debian to enable it also for desktop computers or only for servers? Do you think the targeted policy is suitable for, for a desktop? They are Fedora. We are Debian. We do things better. And yes? <laughs> I mean, the problem is if uh, the users, the not so knowledgeable users have all sorts of subtle problems that don't know where they come from. I think most people will turn it off. Debian should never ship in a form that ordinary users have problems running yeah. the released software. So no, I don't think we are going to be shipping Debian in a form that users have to ask how to shut SE Linux off. Again, I said, we are not Fedora. Do you think it can be made full? I absolutely think it is feasible to run uh, targeted policy on a desktop system. We 
are not there yet, but Lenny is two years off. And if I can get enough of you guys to help me with just sending me what doesn't work on your desktop machine, it doesn't take much to fix the policy so things don't blow up in your face. I think we can do it. So I have rather a dissenting view, as Manoj already knows, and probably now there isn't really there is enough time to go into this, but um, I've worked in the computer security field for, well, probably a couple of decades now, and I'm very much unconvinced that SE Linux is the proper solution to any real security problem. The main difficulty with it, as has been demonstrated by Manager's presentation, is that it is extremely complex. And complexity is pretty much always the enemy of security. And the effort that we're putting into making SE Linux work properly and not break might very well be better spent in some other way, almost any other way. So I just wanted to make that point. I'm sure Manoj and I can discuss this in the bar later. <laughs> hey, I would like to remind people that way back when, even before my time, back in the 1920s, electric motors were um, up front and in your face. There were all kinds of, there were torque equations, there were a number of coils, and you took a squirrel cage motor and you had four or five knobs you tweaked in order to get your electric motor running at the optimal torque load levels. Now, you turn on a microwave, there are three electric motors in there and you don't even know how, how many there are or how they work. The f Until now, running a Linux has been like tweaking the five or six knobs in order to get the motor going right. What I'm looking for is in the next two years, we take the electric motor from a squirrel cage motor with six knobs to that motor in the back of your, Linux, of your Debian box that you never even think about until it tells you that somebody tried to hack into your system and it was prevented. I didn't mean to shut off the conversation. I think I can probably speak for a lot of us. We're pretty ignorant about SE Linux. We hear these terms policy and we don't know exactly what it means. When you say a policy on a file, does that mean an executable file? And the policy says that it can do what? Okay. The Firstly, I think I've got two minutes left and there are people who are hungry. I don't think I can go into this right now. Secondly, I'm out of time. Secondly, uh, is there any talk after this? I think we're breaking for lunch. So even though the video uh, feed might be shut off, I'm willing to stand around for questions. The next thing is, last DevConf, I gave a little talk on SE Linux and tried to cover what SE Linux is and the policies and what it does. I'll be happy to regurgitate this over lunch or, well, that's probably not a good choice of words. <laughs> <laughs> I am here through the week, so just grab me anytime and uh, maybe we can grab a empty boff time frame and I'm, I'll be happy to talk about SE Linux, what it means, how much of an effort it would be for the Joe's sysadmin to run on their machine. Steve? Yeah, my question was, you mentioned that you wanted to have the SE Linux policy installed prior to doing any of the package configuration. Um, and I was wondering why that's a speed advantage in terms of wh why it's preferable to do that before the package. Is there a speed advantage to doing that before the packages are installed or is it a security issue where you want to make sure your full installation is done under an SE Linux context? Uh, there's a security issue and that has to do with labeling the file system. Uh, the reason we need to label the file system is, as I said, there is a subject does stuff to object. What the subject is, the security domain of the subject depends on two things, either the person who is running the process or the security label attached to the process. 
For example, for if we run an HTTP server, we don't want it to be running under the security domain of the sysadmin. We want it to be running at the security ser the HTTP server domain. In order to apply the security domain to var, no, sorry, user bin Apache 2, dpackage has to know that user bin Apache 2 needs to get a security label that says it is a HTTP domain. That is the, uh, uh, mentioned there in the Apache policy module. dpackage knows already how to read the policy in order to label the files un uh, correctly as it is being unpacked. But if it is a policy that is not in the running policy, dpackage won't know how to label it. So that's why we want to have the policy installed before we unpack. Uh, we could even, I could hack around this by having a run, say in aptitude or whatever the front end is. You look at the packages that are going to be installed, you run this one script giving it all the package names that's going to be installed, it will do the policy load even before the package mm -hmm. starts loading anything, which is one way of implementing my pre inch trigger, which doesn't even touch the package code. Yeah, um, so there is a amazing amount of really interesting things that package uh, post-install scripts in particular and package maintainer scripts in general do. And well, the answer to most of that, to like 80% of that is, well, don't do that. Um, a lot of it is there for, for weird reasons and that, my understanding is that's posed a bit of an issue for figuring out how to write policies for letting packages get installed because the, the post inst proceeds to go off and do various things that the policy may not expect it to be even looking at. I, this is, I know it's a very vague question, but I've heard that as a rumor floating around, so maybe you can either debunk that or address that. Uh, all right, two things. Firstly, when you're installing packages, we are running in our own security domain. We are running in apt underscore t or dpackage underscore t domains. So the kinds of things that these domains already do is extensive. So if somebody has managed to corrupt or replace your aptitude or dpackage by a Trojan, you are in a boatload of trouble anyway. I think that so far I haven't encountered anything which is fundamentally unsurmountable. There are some packages which do stuff for which I have to write more security policy. But if these are things that we decide the package needs to do, the security policy is what needs to be changed, not the package itself. If we find that uh, this is stuff that the package shouldn't be doing, whether or not you're running SE Linux, then that's the security hole and which is presumably a release critical bug. So I don't think that SE Linux introduces anything new or different in that domain. I hope nobody is susceptible to epilepsy in here. <laughs> Anything else? All right, I guess we break for food. <laughs>